Welcome everybody again at the Atelier Theater Der Welt, Atelier Dusseldorf Theater Der Welt taking place in a hybrid format. We have today um, a panel on a very important topic, sustainability, which will again be covered from different perspectives. Uh, with speakers as Carmen Olakea from the Impact Leadership Circle, um, based in Argentina, with Stefan Fischer Fels, um, who uh, yes, who is waving to us, fantastic, with Brett Piper from the Wits University in South Africa, and with Rashmi Danwani from uh, Arctic's company in India. Uh, the panel will be facilitated by Mike van Graan. You can find the uh, bios and titles of the speakers uh, on our live stream. And um, the floor is all yours. We are starting with Carmen. So, Carmen, go ahead. So, so I would like I would like to start thanking thanking the Academy for this invitation. Just, uh, Just sorry, uh, sorry, 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 comment. There's uh, there's uh, there's like there's, 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 there's echo. echo. Just to address that. Just to address that. Hello. That's better. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. So I would like to start thanking Festival Academy for this invitation to be among artists thinking together on how to make art more available and at service of human, be human dreams, needs, and possibilities. This week is about 22 festival projects that artists from different corners of the planet developed combining creativity, hope, and the willingness to serve others. Each proposal has a vision behind, a story, the authors tell themselves and around which each piece of the festivals makes sense. And all dimensions of art have been considered in the proposal. In them, we can see that art is present as a language, as technical disciplines, as spaces of encounter with oneself and others, as manifestations of the zeitgeist, as gates to access personal and collective and conscious, and its archetypes, <laughs> and as a way to collectively create new metaphors and narratives to show us a different, better way of being. Our first day, we focused on storytelling. Small and big stories were mentioned, as well as the dangers of stories with one perspective. And we all relate so well with these images because we are, as Harari says, wandering bands of storytelling sapiens. This is what we do and what make us unique among living creatures. Our narratives are the force that creates culture, settle common aims and trigger collective responses. Also, first talking about how humans behave damaging one another and life on earth, Mike asked, how do we change and I would like to try to answer these questions today. We have two extraordinary abilities which constitute the backbone of our power to evolve and transform collectively. These are the ability to be the doers and simultaneously the observers of our dream. And by this, being in perspective to understand what changes are needed and also the ability to elaborate together narratives, to create stories that have the power to join us in search of new questions, beliefs, understandings, and actions. This way, we sustain us in our collective evolutionary processes. And we do this when we have gained new understandings or when we found ourselves collectively in danger and without answers for new problems, or both, like we in the 21st century. 
we have been getting an extraordinary amount of new understandings, and we also have put us in deep danger. And we are taking others with us into an abyss. Today, the notion of new paradigm or paradigm shift is everywhere. And it is used both to name a very specific change and to represent a massive transformation. We can very well say that a paradigm shift is indeed the last one, a massive, complex, painful and joyful, exciting process of leaving behind an old narrative and creating collectively a new one, more appropriate for the understandings and the challenges of the time. And we, those living during the last 170 years, are the ones who have been making the shift. Willingly or reluctantly, we are the ones that have been creating a new story to guide us. So we are already changing. And I take the liberty to say we, and put together people from the 19th century and with people from the 21st century, because the paradigm shift takes a lot of time. But in 2021, we are not anymore at the beginning of our paradigm shift, but quite advanced into it. Our shift started with the appearance of revolutionary understandings that one after the other gave place to a compelling need to think our old narrative. Think how challenging were the perspectives that Marx, Nietzsche and Freud presented in the 19th century. Or consider the level of disruption that the theory of relativity and quantum physics brought to science. Or weight the transformations that came from new sciences like sociology, psychology, ecology or semiotics born at the beginning of the 20th century. And later systemic and complex thinking, artificial intelligence, internet and the revolution in our conceptions of life that came because we saw the earth from outside and realized that we were just a part of a unique ecosystem. And now consider the agonizing process, 60 years long now, of realizing that we have been this ecosystem. Climate crisis, melting of the poles, oceans full of plastic, poisoning drinking water and the land. We can go on and on naming the extraordinary new conceptions and inventions and the crazy behaviors that we have been producing the last 170 years. But the last 60 years have been observing our way of being in life and increasingly understanding that we really need to change. Two of the strongest beliefs that we are trying to leave behind are that human beings are the owners of the earth and superior to other forms of life. And that the planet has no limits, so we can take and take and nothing will happen. This whole thinking has damaged life on earth in a dramatic and in many cases irreversible way. That is why when we look back, trying to find when the new narrative started to find its own words, what we mostly find are references that come from the fields of biology, ecology, environmentalism. But this is a very precise moment. When we started the collective process, it was when a report called Our Common Future presented the reflections of thousands of people about the challenges humankind was facing in 1987. Because this report positioned in a radical way two powerful notions. First, that we need to create a global agenda for change. This is just another way of saying we need a new narrative. And second, the notion of sustainable development, a way to name common direction for human efforts, forgetting to this change. millions of people, collectives and perspectives, the concept that moved from the adjective sustainable to the noun sustainability has become a mantra 
that captures both the gestalt of a possible new narrative born in 1987 and the specific lines of searches, learnings, failures and achievements made in pursuit of this vision. Sustainability is a key notion to express the spirit of our time and with that, the emerging paradigm, the new narrative that is starting to guide us. Yesterday, Dima said, we need to keep the conversation going on. And Inge, the first day, brought Mamanda's statement, now is the time to talk about what we are talking about. For me, these are clear manifestations that we collectively know that our new guiding narrative is a work in progress. And it will be the result of billions of changes among human beings. I have been watching the new narrative emerge for the last 34 years under the umbrella of sustainability. Since 1987, we have never stopped producing new perspectives, agendas, understandings, policies, and collective agreements around the concept. Countless relevant developments in search of sustainability occur incessantly in the planet. From the United Nations 2030 Agenda to the machine that removes plastic from the Pacific, from the first national constitution recognizing rights to nature to the new forest buildings, from a country that has already achieved 50% of renewable energy to a teenage girl who drives the global movement to raise awareness about climate crisis. All these are just examples of the creativity we are experiencing in relation to sustainability. And in all of them, we can see one of the guiding principles of this narrative, the need and willingness to repair and take care of the web of life. We can see now that the old paradigm has deeply contributed to separate inside us culture and nature allowing us to kill our own habitat. Understanding how this disruption has come to occur is essential. The same way that to understand that reconnecting nature and culture is fundamental to promote a new way of being in the web of life. And back to this group, I know I am bringing the notion that because we were born in this time, we are main characters in the creation and realization of the biggest narrative ever. Everybody is now a main character. And this time, everybody is because it's not only about new understandings, it is also about urgent new behaviors towards the earth. But all of us, artists and cultural workers, have also a unique offer for this specific time. Our work by nature is to tell stories, to create conditions of possibility for others to take these stories, be part of them and transform them. So while we keep doing our work with art, I invite all of us to also remember that we can are contributing with the new narrative by creating spaces of encounter with others, manifesting the zeitgeist, opening gates to access collective unconscious and archetypes, and integrating others in this process of collective creation of new metaphors and narratives to guide us to a different, better way of being in life. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Carmen. That was that was really a brilliant way of opening up this conversation this morning. Um, we'll come back to having further kind of questions once we've had all the panelists share their thoughts. And so uh, we welcome you just to listen to what the other panelists have to say. And we'll come back and have the conversation a bit later. We're going to now move on to Stefan. Stefan is going to be interviewing someone apparently. Stefan, over to you. Oh, jetzt darf ich abmachen, ne? Ja, gut, okay. Thank you very much. Is this open? Yeah. Good. So, 
Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Carmen, for these wonderful words. And um, my, uh, my thoughts will maybe g have a good um, connection with, with what you said in general. And my question was, uh, was, what does that mean for festivals? And actually, I wanted, as I'm the, uh, in the board of ACITES, the network for young theatre for young audiences, I wanted to talk about some remarkable formats of the ACITES gatherings and world congresses, but then I felt it's too superficial uh, to talk about that, and I felt like we, we need an, a young voice in our room, and I actually wanted to replace myself by a young 15-year-old activist from Fridays for Future, Düsseldorf, Tara, um, uh, because I wanted to know what she thinks about sustainability and festivals. So I called her, and the presentation I did with the photos have nothing to do with what I say now. So maybe it's nice to the for you to see the confrontation of festivals like they are, and new thoughts which have no photos yet. Should I start? Um, other, uh, that's also maybe interesting uh, for you, not only to see me, but to see some photos. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, I, I, I called Tara, she's 15 year old, and I said, uh, please ta Tara, let's talk about festivals, and my report is now what, what this was this phone call. Um, let's talk about sustainable festivals. Why? You are the experts. If you want to change, you know better than me. Uh, okay, but maybe you can give me some hints. Uh, um, yeah, okay, uh, for whom do you make festivals? For you or for the audience? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, if you do for the audience, you could have another starting point and you could ask what the audience need for a festival and maybe you don't need everything that you think you need. It's a shift of perspectives, okay. Um, sustainable festival has nothing to do with three days traveling around the world, show your performance, have a drink and fly back. But this is how it works in 90% of the festivals today. Well, I think it, you might be right. Um, uh, you can use the online, online tools to invite people f who normally cannot come, but you have to know more about the possibilities in the digital world. Ask young people. Oh, okay, I will really do it. Um, you need tools how to make the online activities more interactive and joyful in order to create a dialogue. Um, okay, um, Tara, let's talk about analog festivals. This is more my uh, world. Um, okay, who is not there and who does not feel invited? Pooh, that's difficult to answer. Okay, could you travel within your own city and find the whole world in a nutshell and invite them to your festival? Would you spend more time to find your audience than to find outstanding performances? A young audience maybe does not need to, need, uh, does not need to see the most expensive scenographies. Maybe that's not in our interest. Okay, but uh, Tara, this is a bit complicated. You know, only, only uh, uh, have simple scenographies. Uh, yeah, okay, but you adults, you always say it's complicated. I'm not interested in that. Um, Take your time, Stefan, to reflect your own document and ideals. Every year there are festivals and more festivals, and every festival thinks about himself and how to be better and bigger than others. It's the spirit of capitalism. Most festivals are neoliberal constructions. Um, do you have to invite so many performances? Why don't you show one performance but for all citizens in your city? What concepts do you have to widen your uh, audience? Tara, um, sorry, I'm, I have no concept, but I will think about it. Okay, but be faster. Um, are you reflecting what you eat in the breaks and which company brings your energy and what kind of materials do you use, including mask, uh, maske, uh, schminke? Uh, in German it's schminke, I don't know the English word, mask, yeah? Uh, makeup, makeup, including uh, sustainable makeup. Yeah, we always start to try, but um, it's expensive. Uh, uh, Tara, it's very expensive. Okay, um, uh, if you think sustainable, Stefan, everything gets more expensive and more valuable. Uh, you have to change the whole economic system if you want to make a sustainable festival. 
Yes. Uh, and regard the invited groups. You must make sure that they can travel slow. Show how perf your performance more times on your way. Develop chains of festivals and develop sustainable paths to your festival. Organize festival on a long-term schedule. You could call somebody and say, come to my city in three years and let's plan the route together with other partners and co-producers. Tell the festival curators, travel for three months in one country and not for three days in 30 countries. Uh, try to know more about this one country. Start sustainable connections. Make friends. Concentrate your program. Um, plant trees near your theaters. P put bees on the top roof. Uh, create CO2 neutral performances. Uh, Tara, sorry, but what does that mean? Find it out. You are in charge, not me. No plastic on stage. This should, this should be the minimum of it. Okay. Um, and then please ask, uh, answer the question how this issue is, dealt, uh, is, is presented on stage. Which dramaturgy is happening for sustainability? Have you constructions to talk about structures and not only about, uh, about individual stories? Um, have you, are you informing? Are you doing catastrophe scenarios? Are you doing empowerment? What's your plan to put it on stage? And include the 17 SDGs from the United Nations in your work. You can even get fundings for that. Um, okay, uh, Tara, do you think politics would, uh, would fund uh, sustainable festivals as a model? I don't know, but maybe you could create panels and workshops for politicians who want to think out of the box. You could talk to politicians about 50 residences for one month as a heart of a festival and not three days and one residency. And uh, please integrate the, f the, the science into the festival. And then you should ask which are the criteria for success for your festival. Is it the number of people and the amount of money that you man make? Who defines quality? Is it the festival director or somebody else? What are at alternative criteria? What about the grade of satisfaction of the audience? What about empowerment? What about the number of impulses you carry home? What about the grade of subs subversive thoughts you smuggle over the border back to your country? Find out more about that. The philosophy of neoliberalism uh, of growing is not the path you should go. I'm sure you know the concepts of unlearning and degrowth. As Tara, I know it a bit. Okay, festivals should be parties of unlearning and understanding, not of representing your conquests. It's not about your vanity. It's all about the people and the political change. Uh, thank you, Sarah. That's much too much for 10 minutes speak in an impulse. I will come back to you. Please come back to me when you have realized at least 20% of these thoughts. Thank you. Um, um, thank, 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 thank you, thank you thank very, you very much, much, Tara. Thank you for channeling Tara. So fun. Fun. Uh, <laughs> I, think I think we're, we're back, back to, to that echo. echo. Yeah, 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 one could uh, um, uh, maybe, maybe just address it. it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So let's move on to Brett. Thanks so much, Mike. And uh, I want to thank Carmen and Stefan for uh, setting the scene so wonderfully. Um, I'm, I'm going to shift register a little bit from uh, the very profound ethical and philosophical questions that they've posed about festival sustainability. Um, and I'm going to talk from a, a slightly more operational perspective at one level. But as we go on, I hope that we can see that these, these issues intersect in a profound way. So I'm going to be stepping into the, the shoes of someone who's a colleague and in fact, a former student, um, uh, Tumi Motswatswe, who works for an organization in Johannesburg, that in the context that Mike described earlier this week around extreme inequality, is trying to craft an ecology for funding creative practice between the business sector and the broader society. And I'm going to try to speak to some of those uh, perspectives from my own experience, albeit not from the organization that she represents, which is called Business and Arts South Africa. So um, at the moment, I um, work in an academic space, and these are some of my lovely students and colleagues. 
um, just before COVID visiting a festival as a site of knowledge production and learning. And we talk a lot about this question of sustainability. And of course, the key idea here is that there are many dimensions to this question. It certainly is not only a financial conversation, although it very importantly includes that. But the challenge is really how we include questions of, sustain of financial sustainability with questions of our environmental footprints, with questions of the social environments in which we work, which in the South Africa of today, which is the post-apartheid, post in other words, the moment in which we are trying to deal with the unresolved questions that the celebrated transition to the post-apartheid moment more than a quarter century ago has left unaddressed at this time. It's a political question, therefore, as well. Um, but there's also, of course, a an aspect to, say, to sustainability that is artistic or curatorial, or as Stefan and, and Carmen have spoken to so, so eloquently, the philosophical side, why do a festival? Um, and, and of course, my point is that these dimensions intersect and they inform each other. And we can't deal with one without thinking about them all together. And that's, of course, one of the great challenges of doing this kind of work. Because, of course, it's a little like flying an aircraft and rebuilding it at the same time. We seldom have the luxury of having the aircraft at the, on the ground and being able to dismantle it to unlearn, I love uh, Stefan's uh, uh, or un, uh, Stefan's interlocutor's description of festivals as parties of unlearning. So, to use a, a term that Vit Vitges has also used, the, one of the gifts of COVID has been that our aircraft have been on the ground. We've been able to dismantle them and ask the fundamental questions that Carmen um, has posed to us. In the context of the few minutes we have together, I'm going to try then to integrate a discussion about financial sustainability with all of those others. And this is a picture of the intersection of Baron van Riede Street and Voortrekker Street in Oudtshoorn. And those of you from South Africa would know the symbolism of those intersections. This is a rural agricultural part of the Western Cape Province in South Africa, about 400 kilometers uh, outside of Cape Town at a national arts festival that I directed. Um, for six years uh, up until 2013. And in the time that I had the challenge of managing a large scale event with 40,000 visitors coming to town over 10 days, buying 200,000 tickets, multi arts, uh, and all the dynamics of that work, uh, one of the hardest lessons I had to learn was that my arts program was but one aspect and actually quite a small aspect, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, of the real challenge of building sustainable festivals. Because beneath the surface of the arts program, there was a lot of commercial activity around our festival, whether we programmed it or not, in bars, in open fields. And of course, there were many people, and in the South African uh, context of extreme inequality, the majority of the people who attend festivals are often spectators of the spectators of the arts program. And what does it mean to wrestle with the concept of a festival that has to take these, these worlds into account? They, of course, this is a continuum rather than uh, distinct sex segments, but, but, but in fact, to, to have someone move from socializing in the festival space to participating in the artistic program that we spend so much of our time and effort and resources investing in, there's so many other aspects that have to enter into this work. And so just to give you some images, the Klein Karoo is an extraordinarily beautiful landscape. And on the outskirts of town, uh, I deliberately curated in that landscape, encouraging people to connect with the land, its histories, of colonization and of contemporary efforts at transformation. Um, and it's an ostrich farm area. In fact, it's the major ostrich farm industry in the world. Using ostrich farms as sites uh, for, for site-specific theater enabled certain things artistically that were enormously exciting. But I knew that most of the local community and most of the people who actually attended the festival never saw or experienced that side of our work. In fact, they were probably milling about in the streets in the commercial zones of the festival, where in an agricultural community, there are vernacular modes of festival, 
um, that in this community uh, divide along racialized lines. This is a sort of combination of a church bazaar, but also in communities that endured slavery in South Africa, certain traditions of gathering next to rivers and celebrating in the open air. Was it possible to bring these different aspects of the people who were actually present around our arts program into some kind of relationship with the arts program? You see in the front uh, right of this corner some beautifully colorful feathers of ostrich feather duster sellers. Could that be incorporated, for example, into street theater, into programming, and so on? And so we did a lot of work in, with the local community. This was a production that involved 100 local young people working. Um, again, you can do wonderful things in the open air if you make your arts program visible there. But how do you pay for it? Especially when funders uh, for the arts program or for the commercial kind of sponsorship side of a festival ha have very specific agendas that don't always align with your social and your philosophical and your curatorial vision. I became fascinated in the prospect of involving farm workers, the most subaltern of the social structure around the, the community in which the festival happened, and to bring them into the festival space. They worked with ostriches on farms every day. What would it be like to give wings to the work that they do and to make that visible in the festival space? And how on earth would one pay for this? So I came to think about festival ecologies in that pyramid, and this is where I'm going to really end my contribution, as an opportunity to be dependent on earned income through ticket sales, because that would only serve audiences who have recreational or dis, you know, a disposable income, as Mike pointed out in his description of South Africa. What would it be like to not be dependent on ticket sales, not be dependent on government funding, not be dependent on commercial sponsorships, even though we had to have some of that in aspects of the program? Because of course, there were aspects of our arts program that was fundable by our National Arts Council. And there were parts of our entertainment programs that was commercially sponsorable. And there were some aspects of our community engagement that could be funded through social programs. But we needed to be quite audacious and wonder whether we could fund ourselves in making the crucial investments in developing audiences and work that didn't yet exist. And so I had to try and think about the ways in which those different constituencies in and around the arts program, in the holistic experience that is a festival, could perhaps feed each other. And that was the idea of sustainability that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much, Mike, and I look forward to our ongoing discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Brett, for stepping in as you have and for also um, extending the understanding of, of sustainability and for bringing in different dimensions. So I think I look forward to us engaging in the conversation a little bit later. Um, let's move on to India and Rashmi. So good to have you here with us, Rashmi. Happy to be your mic. Thank you so much. Should I just dive straight in? Great, fantastic. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here. A festival is an area of interest and passion and has been so for a while. So I'm quite happy to be able to share some of the insights that we've gleaned from our work over the last year and a half in particular. I'm just going to share my screen. Just bear with me a second. All right, I can see that my presentation is on the presentation slides. I know that all of you can see it. Uh, my name is Rashmi Dhanwani and I'm from the Artex company, uh, which is a, 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 a consulting organization based out of India. And our work cuts across advising cultural organizations on how to articulate the value of the work that we do in the arts in the ways in which we can help them articulate that, which is research on the one hand, so data and statistics and evidence, and audience development on the other. And part of her work, which started out as being a smaller part and has emerged into a much larger part of her work, has become engaging with the cultural sector and the community of creative professionals to try and look at various dimensions of our work, including advocacy, sector de development, uh, workshops, training. Um, and it's, it's this part of our work which I'm bringing forth today. Uh, we've been working 
uh, quite closely with British Council. So some of the what I'm sharing with you is coming from from that. But to begin with, I wanted to ask this question about sustainability and what sustainability means. The slide is a mood slide now because all uh, all of my uh, you know colleagues and speakers here have already delved a little bit deeper into that. But what struck me about sustainability is how we think of uh, sustainability as as a larger whole, and, and Brett actually covered that beautifully in his presentation. Uh, what what I thought uh, while while putting his presentation together is just sort of look at a slightly diffused version of what that sustainability is. So what Brett has already covered, which is the social, financial, the environmental, and to a certain extent the cultural or artistic aspects of uh, sustainability, but also the political, which I have not covered yet, primarily because I'm looking at cultural festivals as uh, uh, cultural festivals in India, if we go into the dimension of social festivals or social religious festivals, it can get very political very fast. So that's 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 an area that I've steered away from uh, for our presentation. But if if you look at this chart, what you're seeing is the diffuse version of uh, the diffusion of what financial sustainability means. So how can we be sustainable in the way we run, our, you know, our festivals or the way we fund our festivals uh, or the way we survive and sustain our work. In terms of the environment, how do we look at production and restoration? Restoration in the realm of what is that? What is the stuff that we can do that continues to survive after us? But also production in terms of what materials we are using in producing our work and what is the supply chain of the material that we are using? So looking at all of those dimensions and a diffusion of that. So when we talk about the social aspect, how do we look at sustainability of our community, sustainability of our network? Something that has come up so prominently particularly over the last years, Carmen was also shedding some light on who are we as a community. And here's an opportunity to be able to sort of rethink and reshape that blueprint of what we are trying to do. So just picking up from Yanad, you know, I know that we have a full day ahead of thinking through some of these ideas, but maybe it may be useful to think about this diffusion and where does it apply to our work. And what I'm going to do now is focus on India because that's where I come from and, and specifically look at the work that we've been doing in the past year uh, with, a, with a program called British Council Festival Connections, where we've been working with the cultural community in India to talk about the challenges that the festival community has been facing uh, in doing its work in India over the last year. And this data that I'm sharing with you has come from 18 digital and physical events that we've done since late 2019, uh, with 69 festival directors, curators, speakers, and sponsors, and about uh, almost 2,000 attendees. These are mainly qualitative uh, insights, so we've not gotten quant insights some of the sessions that we ran over the last year. Uh, amongst the questions that are asked, I'm going to try and sort of uh, shed some light on, on three of those. So the first one being, how has COVID-19 impacted the funding of festivals? And here, um, I'd like us to look at what the priorities of cultural festivals today look like. So these are some of the insights that have emerged is what has gone up is, is the, the, the footfall and audience engagement expectations. How are we engaging the audiences? How are we expecting to engage the audiences? How are the audiences expecting to engage with us? Uh, when it comes to funding, uh, sponsors essentially and, and funders essentially look at how many people are engaging with you. So the quality and the quantity is both being looked at quite significantly. When we're talking about the digital landscape, you think you can attract a larger number of people, but it may not always be possible in terms of the qualitative output. So these are priorities that have gone up. Of course, health and safety expectations and expenses both. Uh, our ability to plan nimbly as opposed to long-term planning. And of course, all the associated health and insurance costs that go with uh, with you know reorienting our priorities. And what's depleted, of course, is in India specifically, arts is lower on the priority list. So the sector is really struggling at the moment. It has impacted production costs and profit margins without doubt. Uh, some of the sessions that we held was on sponsorship. So it looked at how it connects with internal approval for festival funding, uh, particularly in the realm of sponsorship. So how sponsors have been behaving over the past year and the concerns that they are facing, which has led to some festivals working out and some festivals have who've had to shut down at least for the last year. So these are some of the quotes that I wanted to share with you from um, the festival directors and, and participants of the program um, sessions that we had last year. So one of them, who is the director of the literature festival spoke about, you know, when SOPs, uh, the standard operating procedures have been put forth, costs across the board go up. So how do we think of sustainability when you have to meet this cost and there is no funding coming in? Um, Captain was uh, another uh, festival director from uh, Boomtown in the UK, um, who spoke about the inability to move forward uh, and how it all depends on how the COVID situation or the health situation evolves. Uh, 
Um, Ili Jaffer spoke about how priorities of sponsors are changing. This is a, a slide from one of our uh, sessions where uh, we were looking at how brands have begun to measure return on investment today. Uh, when I say today, I mean post uh, pandemic in some, or rather during the pandemic last year in some sense. And this was another interesting one. So Asian Paints is a, is a very big paint uh, brand in India. And uh, this is a quote by them where they spoke about how they now take into account what actually makes sense in the current time and how they can look at you know, the brand as having a sense of responsibility and the fact that even they can't afford to fall. So on the one hand, while we're talking about sponsorships have reduced, well, how are the sponsors and the brands thinking about those dimensions? The next question was looking at new business and partner, uh, partnership models around sustainability of festivals. So here, I wanted to sort of give you a few examples of what's happened in India. So some festivals have started their own platforms like the NS7 Weekender Festival, uh, which reinvented itself digitally with its own platform. So you can see the kind of interaction that's happening on the screen. And they had about 60,000 plus attendees. This was a fully funded festival in the sense that there's a brand sponsorship involved. Some festivals have renegotiated this experience with their funder, for instance, the Jaipur Literature Festival, and they've benefited in different ways. So JLF, which could look at, uh, it's one of Asia's largest free literary festivals, um, uh, and then one of the biggest literary festivals in the world. Physical formats, 13,000, 14,000 people. Digital formats, they've had per session, they have two to three sessions a week. Per session, they're getting about 30,000 viewers. So what does this mean, the quality of these disengagement, but also at the same time, what does it mean in terms of scale? So renegotiating those terms with your funders become really critical and important. How do you collaborate with the relevant partners? Here's an example of a theater festival, a small theater festival in Bangalore, in India, which has collaborated with a ticketing partner to create different formats of, uh, you know, uh, theaters and, and plays online. And what are the different ways of reconfiguring some of these models? So here is, uh, you know, the Serendipity Arts Festival, which used to happen in Goa, multi arts, enormous amount of work. They have re-envisioned the festival keeping the internet as a site. And much of this work is live, so you can check it out. This is a work that we had done with, again, a ticketing partner where we got uh, museums from across the country to collaborate with each other, something that they never done before. So how can you reconfigure ways in which you yourself have been working, uh, which would be quite useful? I'm going to share this with you so you don't have to go through it in, de in detail, but this was uh, what I thought was a brilliant example shared by another festival director who spoke about a three-step process when it comes to sustainability. Um, and he spoke about surviving, planning, and then playing. So surviving had to do with how do you make sure you're cutting down on your costs? How do you look at planning? How do you split your teams to ensure that one team is taking care of survival, the other team, team is taking care of next steps and thinking through? And the third is experimentation, play. Trust your audience to help you find your niche. You don't have to have the final uh, colors and everything well-designed and beautiful at this stage. And the last question that I wanted to address was what are the key challenges to monetization and distribution? Here again, it's just provocations more than answers. Again, emerging from these insights, um, there is a cycle of monetization. When we think of how to monetize, you have to think of the cost that you're going to incur, um, the value that your audience has placed on the work that you're creating or the festival that you're putting out there, the experience that you're creating, and the revenue model that conflates the two. Uh, from our insights, what emerged you know, when it comes to cost is how the infrastructure needed is changing in the digital realm, uh, how different it is from the physical realm. What about training of, of artists, of uh, internal team members, but also of the audiences? Uh, production costs, of course, and how artists fees change, uh, even with the digital landscape. Uh, how do you gain audiences' um, confidence back? Where are they spending their time? There was a statistic that, I was, that came through in, in our insights again that uh, the, the time spent on OTT platforms has gone up by 40% in India and on gaming has gone up by 140%. So where, you know, I, I often tell when I, when I give sessions on audience development, I often tell uh, my, my students about your, your biggest uh, competition when you're running an arts event is if the audience wants to do nothing. So if that's your competition, how do you look at, how do you re-engage your audiences? And of course, honesty, how do you tell the audience that you're also experimenting and work with them to renegotiate that value? and the related revenue models. I'm sure we'll dive deeper into that. Um, some, again, some quotes from our speakers here um, uh, who were a part of our sessions last time. And finally, the cycle of distribution, uh, which again, leads to creation, distribution, and consumption. You can't look at distribution in isolation. So when it comes to the entire sort of renegotiation of this distribution cycle, how do you create 
How do you ensure that the shared experience that will impact the kind of distribution that you're able to sort of enhance or you know na- negotiate and navigate around, uh, both in terms of expectations and and actual production, and also how is that experience, uh, the distribution being consumed? So this entire cycle needs to be looked at while thinking through sustainability of this distribution cycle as well. Um, so. just to sort of again not look at the physical what is digital digital but look at it as a slightly different experience in terms of how is it that it allows you for more visibility and a more frequent connection to audience uh, but at the same time it doesn't necessarily have to replace live under philip runs a uh, uh, under 25 summit for younger people and he had a completely different perspective from most of our other festival directors who spoke about their work And finally, I just wanted to sort of leave you with this one very interesting slide, uh, which uh, you know was a, was a group of people talking about what do you need to stay uh, to stay alive and resilient as a cultural festival or a professional in these times. And it came everything from continuing to engage with the community, rethinking what you're doing, engaging with your uh, core audience, and asking them what they want, reinventing, and taking a deep breath. Uh, and and real, you know understanding that you can only you can take one step at a time. You don't have to rush into things. um we have a bunch of things coming up which i can share with you later we have another fresh program of festival connections coming up in this year uh we are also working on this massive digital portal to get all of the festivals together and uh i'm looking forward to all our conversations today thank you so much excellent thank you so much rashmi i will look forward to your sharing more with us um a little bit later in the in the conversation um so so this is the time when we you know engage with our panelists and ask various questions to to, to yeah to interrogate some of what they've spoken about a little bit deeper and also to invite the panelists to kind of engage with each other as well um and i think i'd like to maybe start with the first question because it seems that from the first two presentations if i may be provocative is as the second two presentations the the second two presentations seem to be understanding sustainability in a bit of a broader way than sustainability that was particularly linked to the environment and to climate change and the like which appear to be what common i'm not sure if i'm mischaracterizing your presentation and and what stefano said but i just want you to maybe take that a little bit further because when we break down sustainability essentially what it means is how do we continue a particular activity or an event or an organization indefinitely or for as long as we want and so the 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 the, the challenge is um what are the potential threats to carrying on a particular organization or a festival or an event indefinitely and um i think that what brett was seeming to indicate was that there were a whole bunch of dimensions and i think that's what rashmi was coming to as well so i suppose common because your 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 input was so beautifully uh, beautifully philosophical and dealing with a lot of the macro issues that we are engaged with um internationally around the sustainable goals and the like i wondered about how you would respond to organizations that when they were beginning to talk about the sustainable development goals in 2015 or 2016 or so um they began there was this movement about trying to integrate culture into the sdgs because i think there was a lot of concern that the millennium development goals had not really realized their full potential because of a lack of taking account of culture so that there are some organizations that now speak about the fourth dimension of a sustainable development being culture as opposed to only the economic dimension the social dimension and the environmental dimension and i just wondered where you are you kind of respond to that movement culture as an integral part of development sustainable development i would like to say that i i believe that our paradigm shift our new narrative encompass all dimensions of our life is mostly a new way of thinking how we should be on earth in connection with the rest of the living creatures in, on earth is not only about environment is we are genius we are awful but we are genius and we can we can find so many new ways of doing things and 
I understand that digital has been perceived as a second class uh, solution for being together, but it's also the second world we have created. And it is a completely different mindset to be on digital than to be directly. And, and the next generations will be feeling naturally in both worlds, feeling comfortable in both worlds. What I think is that in, is in culture where we put all the logics, the criteria of the new way of being in life is there where we are uh, putting all the, the complexity of our change. So I totally agree, is culture a fourth pillar? Is definitely is not one SDG and definitely is not the fourth pillar, is all over. Everything has to do with culture, is how we change. It's only that the environment that make us so nervous because we need to change fast, is taking a lot of place. But it's when we take the fear out and we look what means all our search for a bit more environmental behavior, what we really see is the ethic of care, as Leonardo Boff expressed it so beautifully, no? to take care of the other of, of life. No? In a way, we all human beings, we are the colonizers of the earth. So every concept that is so clear for us when we talk about gender or in inequalities, when we take distance and we see ourselves in relation to life, we are all of us doing the wrong things. <laughs> so it's a matter of changing the way of being on earth. Yeah, Brett, were you putting up your hand? Did you want to come in there? No, okay. That's, that's, that's beautiful, Carmen. And, and, and I must say, I have to agree with you that because in terms of what you were saying as well, and I was being provocative in asking the question because actually in your presentation, you were saying exactly that anyway. You were talking about the need for a new narrative, which is about an all-encompassing approach. And, and you were talking about, when you talk about new narratives, you're basically talking about changing the way we think about things, changing our value system, changing our beliefs about things as well. And that's, what, and that's to do with culture. Um, and in some of the discussions we were having yesterday, I was um, in a one-on-one -on -one with Abdul Hakim from Afghanistan, and we were, we were talking about these kinds of things as well, how that a lot of the conflicts that may be based or rooted in inequality come to be textured by belief systems and value systems and the like, and that mm -hmm. the importance of resolving conflicts that may be rooted in inequality need to take account of people's value systems, of their belief systems. We need, in other words, to change culture in order for the changes that we bring about to be sustainable. And that's why this notion of culture as being the fourth pillar of sustainable development is so important. So, 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 so thank you for that. I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit more, but maybe just to move on to, to Stefan. Stefan, in terms of what you've heard Brett and Rashmi say, do you think, and again, I'm being provocative, that your focus on the environment and even that of your young interlocutor Tara might be a bit limited in other words by focusing on the environment as important as it is is it not a question of privilege that precisely because within a German or European context you might have the political space to do the work that you do. You might have financial resources to do the work that you do so that you concentrate on the environment. Whereas in an African context, the political dimension of sustainability may be very important. If you don't have the political space or if there's tyranny, if there's oppression and repression and you don't have the space to do your work as a festival, as an organization, you're not, you're not sustainable. sustainable. Even if you are, even if you are, you know, as, as environmentally, environmentally sensitive, sensitive as, 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 so, so if you don't have, you resources, don't have resources to, to employ your, your staff, staff and the like, like you, you are unsustainable. So, so I'm, just I'm just wondering, wondering and asking, asking this, this question. question. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm getting, getting that echo, that echo again. again. I'm asking the question because a lot of festivals and activity within the arts in Africa, for example, are dependent upon resources coming from Europe. And quite often, people have to panel beat what they do to fit in with the new policies that are emanating from Europe. 
in order to access the resources that come with it. So if you have a very narrow definition of sustainability and linking it particularly to the environment, does that then not limit the capacity of people elsewhere to engage with European partners around a different understanding of sustainability? Sorry, that's a long question to you, but I hope you get what I'm asking. Mike, my answer is yes. Okay, okay, thanks. thanks. Next. next. Shall we, Shall we move, move on? on? <laughs> Let's get here. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can say it better than you. <laughs> I, I thought uh, in more and more in the in the discussions of the European uh, sustainability uh, discourses, there is the social in the social dimension of it, um, and I think the social dimension in the in this discourse should be sharing resources, sharing knowledge, taking I don't know ten percent of the budgets of the Western European festivals to uh, to have um, real uh, exchange to get people here and uh, ma make it possible that they can travel but not we are traveling. So I think there are a lot of concrete ideas that could be, um, uh, that, that which we could uh, um, support the social dimension of sustainability. Okay, okay. and then if and we came to you and said, we'd like to give us 20% as opposed to 10%, would, would that be an option? So I, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a serious question, and if you put it in, in the discourses of the Western European, they say, oh my God, 10%, wh what does that mean for me? I have to change my whole life. And I think uh, it's not even 5% of your whole life that you have changed if you give 10% of your budget. But it, has a, it, it means a change of thinking, and this starts with the artists, and it goes to the politicians, because they will say, I give you this amount of money, why are you giving this money? So, so the, the whole philosophy has to be changed, but this has been said by Carmen and by, by you, Mike, uh, uh, many times, so, uh, so I don't want to repeat that. Yeah, yeah. But, but Stefan, Stefan, I think, I think that, that what, what this, this kind of shows, shows is, is the importance of these kinds of conversations, right? And I think that's what the beauty of the atelier is. It's about bringing people together to have these conversations from across our different experiences and our different living and political conditions so that by understanding these things globally, we can come up with global solutions as opposed to it being a solution that has relevance within a particular context, but it doesn't have relevance elsewhere. So. So thank you very much for your for your honesty and engagement. We really, really appreciate, appreciate it. And, and I'm going to ask my co-facilitator, Victor, who is watching the chat on our behalf, to also look at some of the questions there and maybe to feed some of those questions into, into the panel. Yes. Um, uh, we're using the same computer, Stefan and I, which is fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a question from Natalia to Brett. Do you mean that you find funds for the entertainment side of the festival and you share the budget with the artistic program in order to sustain the works that sponsor will not support? And this is about economical um, sustainability. Right, right. I tried to that lately in the chat, but the, the, the concept was more to realize that there were actually venues around our festival that were making a profit that did not have a relationship with us and to try to actually do the hard work of building partnerships with those commercially successful um, parts of the program so that we could ourselves redirect or redistribute some of that towards our social programs and even parts of our arts program. So, I mean, another interesting example of this, I spoke to the founder of the Cape Town International Jazz Festival and said, what would you do differently after what you know now about sustainability for the festival? And he said, I would have started a travel agency when I started the festival, because most people who travel to the Cape Town International Jazz Festival come from outside of Cape Town, either from Gauteng, where Johannesburg and Pretoria are, or internationally. And it's quite an interesting challenge to think about the work that we do in its, you know, those secondary industries around us. And if we could see them as actual parts of what we do, if, if not very close partners, it opens the opportunity, and I think this is the key, Natalia, in the context in which we've been discussing things. Uh, unfortunately, when the agendas of funders or sponsors shift, it doesn't always line up with our social vision and our artistic vision. And can we ourselves become funders of a greater part of what we do? This is the challenge. Thanks. 
I maybe just wanted to, while Victor's just looking for another question in the chat, um, ask Rashmi, um, just in the in the chat now, Rashmi, you're sharing this um, impressive article on what does sustainability mean for the art world. Um, and since you know the article very well, I wonder if you could maybe articulate for us, because that's that's essentially what we're dealing with in this in this particular uh, session. What does sustainability for the arts really mean? And then obviously that's related to festivals. So if you can maybe just summarize what that article says and why you think it's such an important article. Sure. So this article actually looks at um, what one of the important commissions in the, of the late 80s called the Brundtland Commission, which, you know, they work to define sustainable development in art. Um, and, and it sort of digs, takes, takes it from there and then looks at policy dimensions of what that means. And then again, breaks, breaks down aspects of what sustainability means. And uh, as I mentioned, it specifically looks at uh, production, you know, so everything, uh, the different kinds of sustainable art that you can look at. So wh while it's sort of going back and forth on uh, the role of sustainability in art and how it, you know, looks at aspects of social consciousness, um, touching upon what Carmen also spoke about, you know, collectively, uh, and, and you you also mentioned earlier that in order to talk about sustainability, you need a shift in culture, and that's what art can do. So the role of art in that dialogue of sustainability as as uh, it not just being a partner, but a key actor in driving that conversation forward. And then deep diving further into how do you look at different kinds of art that's sustainable. So it's sort of broken down into closed loop fashion, ecological art, uh, land art, renewable energy, energy sculpture, upcycling, um, different types of sustainable art. And, and so very, very production heavy uh, in that sense. And, and so I, what I thought was just, you know, just looking at it from a policy point of view and then coming down to actual creation was, was a nice flow uh, of thinking about sustainability. Uh, but just to sort of, again, I just wanted to add to what Brett was saying uh, about uh, self-sustainability. And that is something that, you know, it, it's a big term in India called Atmanirbhata. It's politically very fraught at the moment because our prime minister has used this word in the middle of a pandemic, asking our communities to be self-sustainable and without any any support from the state. So it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because we are forced to be self-sustainable. And what a lot of what we saw last year uh, with the pandemic was that we had no support system. You don't have associations, you don't have a policy framework that allows you to understand how do you negotiate and navigate through these contexts and situations? And that is something that creates a challenge. That is something that creates a big challenge in uh, creating, a, a, you know, in, in sort of thinking about the larger philosophical dimensions of sustainability. When you don't have food in your stomach, when you don't know when your next meal is going to come from, which is what happened to loads of people here, uh, how do you talk sustainability in those contexts? So as uh, you know, um, uh, both Carmen and I think Tara, I'm, I'm going to have a very interesting conversation with Tara whenever that is, is, is you know, sustainability is expensive. And and how do you think about those dimensions when uh, you're struggling to survive? So it's, it's just something that, that uh, you know, we've been mulling over it quite a bit. And uh, it does go into a direction of you know, the neoliberalism aspect of things, of, you know, the capitalism and wanting to earn uh, what are the other ways of surviving and wanting to still continue to be in the arts and work in the arts with these constraints. So these are these are some larger, if not barriers, definitely questions that we need to ask ourselves if you want to go ahead on the journey of thinking about sustainability for the cultural festival space. Yeah, I think it, it probably does come down to quite a fundamental question that Tara does ask. Why are you doing festivals? Who are you doing festivals for? And I think it's a very provocative question that um, Esther has raised in the chat as well. What if we come to the conclusion that um, sustainability requires that we don't have any festivals? Um, you know, it, it basically, it's a, it's a question of existentialism. The, the existential, uh, well, the continued existence of festivals versus our continued existence as human beings sort of thing. Um, and there aren't necessarily things that are kind of juxtaposed to each other in terms of you know either one or the other, but it's a question of in the context of us being challenged with regard to sustainability, what are the choices that we make? And it's a it's an interesting question as well because in relation to notions of travel that Tara also raised, and I maybe want to bring this up with Stefan again, um, because in some research I think in that was shared with us in one of the earlier ateliers, um, Stefan. It was found by a researcher, I think in Germany, who researched festivals in Germany, who came up with this um, conclusion that in fact, 
there was less carbon emission that was emitted by people who travel to festivals from abroad as participants in the actual program than from the audiences who traveled to the festival. So in other words, those who used their cars to get to the festival, there was far more CO2 kind of emissions by them. And that's something that need, needed to be addressed. Is that something that you're familiar with, Stefan? And, and, and can you just talk a little bit about how how festivals are dealing with with this question in in Germany? Sorry, Mike, I, I didn't understand the question. So uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I lost. No, 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 no worries. worries. No, no, I was, I was just, just saying, saying that, that earlier. earlier yeah, yeah, sorry, yes, yes, sorry, that, yes, that, yes, um, that um, feedback, feedback again, guys. Again, guys. Yeah. In an earlier atelier. Um, are you able to hear me now, Stefan? Are you able to hear yeah. me? It's, it's a bit yeah. yeah. I don't know. Okay. So, so some a researcher was saying that in Germany, there was some research that was done that showed the people who were invited to take part as performers in festivals, they emitted less CO two than the people who came as the audience to the festivals. And so it wasn't a question of slow travel and these kinds of things. Sorry, it doesn't look like I'm um, getting through to Stefan. Is someone able to communicate with him? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have an answer to that. So, so why don't, why don't, why don't why you, give you give any, any answer, answer you, you, like, you like? Imagine what question, question, I've, question asked I've asked and, and you give me an answer. An answer. <laughs> uh, um, I, I thought, uh, when, because I'm working in the, in the Schauspielhaus, I always thought that they should take their bicycles to come to the performances. Uh, uh, this would be much easier, but I'm also uh, working in the Young Theatre House. And there, the, the young people take buses and bicycles, and I think that's the future. <laughs> so, so that's 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 the, the question of this artist traveling, uh, I, I think it's, uh, of course they have to travel, of course we need festivals. Um, uh, it, it, the question, if, if we can rethink the festivals in a total different way, that really people are staying here for a month and really get to know this country or the curators are staying for one month or two months in a country, but this would mean a total different thinking uh, and, and, and organization and a funding that, that is totally different from what we have now. But this would be something interesting because then you don't travel 30 times but one time and then you really sure, get to sure. know one country. Uh, this seems to me what, uh, this seems to be in a nutshell the, the consequence of what the shift of narratives and the shifts of idea would mean to us. Yeah, yeah. Stefan, while Stephen you're there, and I'm sorry for, I'm, I'm not picking on you and I hope you don't get that, but just because, um, you know, you are here with us, I'm trying to pose a couple of questions to you because you, the one person from Europe that is there at the moment, there's, there's this notion of epidemic expediency that the authorities kind of use the pandemic to deliver policies that they wanted to anyway, that might be conservative, nationalistic, chauvinistic, and they use the pandemic to really introduce those policies under the guise of the pandemic. So for example, if they are very concerned about migration and people coming from elsewhere, then that's something they've always been concerned about and now they use the pandemic as a way of basically saying, sorry, folk, you can't come to our country because you're not vaccinated or we fear that you might bring the virus with us. And so I suppose the question I'm trying to pose is, is that not something similar that could be used if we take the environment as being the primary reason why we prevent people from coming into Europe, for example, that might be a good reason, but actually it simply serves much more conservative and nationalistic kind of interests in doing so. And how does one balance those things out? How does one interrogate that? 
I think it's not solved this question because because in the, we have many right wing uh, governments in the, in Europe who take this pandemic uh, to to reinvent nationalism and 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 maybe to infect also festivals and all this stuff. Even in Germany, we have a scandalous uh, policy of uh, visa uh, uh, for some countries, which is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and and of course, you're, you're right. We have a like a, a tension between between sustainability and the need of more dialogue of g in global, yeah, in global yeah. uh, uh, and, and I have not solved this in my thoughts. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit helpless in that. Well, hopefully by the end of the atelier, we'll all have a little bit more thinking around how we do this. <laughs> and this is partly a way of doing it. It's through, through, through technology. But thank you very much, Stefan, for... Uh, for and it's for not about, for me, it's not about technology, but maybe technology is the solution. But maybe this is my generation problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring Tara next. Um, Victors, are there other questions that you'd like to pick up on from the chat? There aren't any um, questions, no, in the chat, but um, I just have a point that I would like to add. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the sustainability. We uh, thank you for the introductions, everyone. It's um, um, panelists. It's uh, it sort of gives you the breadth of this, and um, and I've been thinking a lot in my festival. We are in the middle of the North Atlantic. Everybody, all the artists, need to fly to us. We are um, isolated from the world in more than one way, uh, physically, but also. A little bit culturally uh, through the ages we have been and it's just just in the recent decades that we've opened up really um, so we're quite a young nation culturally but I've I've um, and I struggle with I feel it's extremely important to introduce Icelandic audiences to international artwork I, I really believe in that I really believe in it as a peacemaking tool as a way to to understand the world and engage with the world in a in, in a very different way than you can do through watching movies or 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 the news or um, whatever. So uh, I still firmly believe in that, and I and uh, my festival will keep um, inviting international artists to Iceland. Um, but um, I've I think um, Stefan touched on something that I've been thinking a lot about, and this is how do you make the most how do you create the most possible cultural value and social value out of each um, carbon footprint that you um, imprint on Earth? It's, uh, it's, uh, how do you um, balance the cultural footprint, which is also about making the world a better place, it's about peace, it's about understanding um, the world and really um, looking um, the world in the eye, not just your local peers. How do you balance that with the, the carbon footprint? And I think this is, uh, and I said this earlier in this atelier, going deeper, going slower, really changing the way we think about um, things. Having these in-out visits from artists from abroad, expensive in-out concerts, I think they need to belong to history now. This is not the way to go. We can do those online or... Or, and then the rich people can travel to the country where these concerts are being held anyway. Really, seriously, I, I don't, I think we, we uh, there are such few, for example, to Iceland, we are only 350,000. There are so few international events that get brought to Iceland. Although it's been an explosion in the past 20 years, it's still uh, very little compared to um, uh, Europe, the rest of Europe. But we... This needs to be a few. There, what's left behind needs to be worth it, and uh, and this takes time. Yeah, I think that. that sorry, Stefan, you wanted to say something more. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I just wanted to say. Um, oh my God! So. All these technical things are disturbing me so much in my thoughts. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and, and I think in German all the time. Um, um, I think the, 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 the question of classism is coming back. Uh, we are not talking only about, uh, we are talking about that many festivals are, uh, for, are made by people for 
the people they know, for the bubbles they know. And I think this has to be radically tackled, this question, because this, it's an old question, but it comes back in a new form now. Yeah, I, I suppose what you both seem to be saying is that there's not only a need for new narratives, but also for the people who are telling those narratives to be physically present. Um, because it's about relationship building. It's about seeing people. It's about getting to know other in order for the shifts to kind of happen. It's not good enough simply to have tokens or symbols that you know we've had in the past. It's now about relationship building, essentially. Victor? Sorry, sorry, you been muted. muted. Oh, sorry. I was saying this is also sustainability. That this is cultural sustainability. Yeah. This is social sustainability, and this and and the, it has an impact on the environment, but it is also sustainability in another sense. If that oh, makes Alan. sense. And I, I think it's very mind blowing for me to put to connect the foot the carbon footprint to the to the uh, cultural value to say how is this your travel should have a deep value in my festival, in my country, in this moment. And how can we do that? This is a concrete question we can answer. I would like to say, to say that just for one moment, why don't we separate in our brains culture and what culture can contribute to damage the environment? Because I would like first to, of all, answer is there. Is that we cannot live without festivals and gathering around culture? That we cannot do. So, it, we, we, if we got to this answer, it's more sustainable not to have festivals. Then we have to start thinking again, because gathering around around culture is essential for us just to live and imagine when we are in in times of danger. This is one thing. Second, there are two things that we have to be very alert in these times. One thing is that the old thinking resists to disappear. Obviously, it's never something easy. So the new thinking, while it is building the plane, while it's play, is driving the plane, <laughs> is at the same time confronting the old thinking. And this is, is not only bad uh, behavior, it's nature behavior. We, we, we like to be on control of things. So when we have to challenge our own way of living, it becomes very difficult and challenging and half of us start resisting and the other ones opening new doors. How? Through culture. And now when we realize culture is essential, then we can think first, what happened in Iceland with this place that was open to any artist, local artist to come and do whatever they want, that is for me the essence of what we have to do everywhere in the planet, to promote community art, to promote people gathering around whatever they are doing in their own community. And then in festivals, we create these situations to gather all these efforts that have been working the whole year. Festivals are windows and are challenges and are the time to put things, different things together for the audience to realize ah, and go back to their own communities and work in a different way, the way they work with art. Because art, and this is the second important thing, is moving inside us, innovation and creativity. And this is what we need to imagine a new world, a new narrative, a new way of doing things. I mean, I think you've just very beautifully articulated exactly why, um, you know, the proponents of this notion of culture as the fourth de pillar of, de of, of development is so important because on the one hand, as you were saying in your earlier talk, culture as a transversal phenomenon has to be integrated into the pursuit of the sustainable development goals. It has to do with changes of behavior, changes of values, changes of beliefs. So mm -hmm. we get that. But what you're also now basically arguing for is for the arts to kind of be recognized as being an important part of social development, of community development, all of these things that have to do with, you know, how we are 
having to be human and engaged and connected to each other in the future. Um, and so, so thank you very much for that. I wanted to maybe probably work towards the end of this conversation by asking some of the difficult questions that Yusuf is raising in the chat and that Rashmi was trying to get some clarity about. Because I think, and, and I think that Brett kind of alluded to it in his um, presentation as well, that the notion of um, sustainability, how is that linked to our concept of business models? Traditionally, business models are very much about, hey, how do we get the money that we need in order to keep our festival going? That's essentially you know, how we've understood business models in the past. But when we're looking at sustainability in this broader way that we've been discussing now, that has a political dimension, environmental dimension, a cultural, a social dimension, our business plans, our understanding of business plans needs to be extended as well. So how do we go about, and obviously COVID-19 has challenged us to come up with particular business plans where we are no longer having box office, for example, in the case of theater or festivals. How do we, how do we sustain what it is that we do? So insofar as COVID-19 has presented us with these challenges and giving us opportunities to define new business models, I wanted to maybe ask Rashmi and then Brett as well, um, what do you think the new business model for a festival is going to be looking like post COVID-19 in terms of trying to give some answer to what Yusuf has asked. Thank you for that question, Yusuf. I saw that you replied to me, but it was a direct message, so I missed it. Uh, I was trying to get the clarity. Uh, that's a really important question because as I was mentioning earlier, we've been struggling with this notion of self-sustainability in India, in the absence of network. Um, and something that we've learned over the last year, and I, I, I'm just going to break this down, is uh, from what Dhruv had shared, the three steps to sustainability, and the first step being survive. Um, and what I thought was very interesting about that was this notion of frugality. How frugal can we be? Um, this also points to what Laurent was sharing earlier uh, about you know, sustainability on its own and, and what does that uh, mean? I mean, how do you extend that cultural footprint of that carbon footprint? Um, it points to me, it, it sort of points to two dimensions, right? One is making things last. What is sustainability? You can, things can be sustainable if they last. And things can be sustainable if, if you feel the uses, so, uses over of that work, but you ask yourself another question that can it be used in another way? So while thinking of frugality, if you're able to ask this question, uh, that would be the first step. I have um, you know, a festival budget or I have a small amount dedicated to production. How can I make most use of that money? Uh, where is that money best utilized? Do I need to spend this amount right now? Do I need to have this particular resource on board? Constantly asking yourself those questions will allow us to limit what we are uh, thinking we need to spend. There's a, there's a bit of a famous saying in India called Apni chadar utna hi felao jitna fela sakte ho, which is your, your sheet, uh, the cloth that you use to cover yourself at night is only as big uh, as it is. You, know, you can't spread it further than that. So you have to think of it that way. The second step, um, which I thought was very useful, again, in, in, in the way Dhruv was thinking, uh, is how do you continue to survive? So be con continuously monitoring where your monies are, but how do you plan for the future? How do you be nimble in that thinking and planning? And that means that um, where are your related connection points with other sectors, um, other partners, other relationships that you can keep building on? Uh, one of the dangers that has, I mean, that has been highlighted because of the pandemic is this excessive reliance on the cultural sector and the community for everything. And when the community did not have anything to give, where do you go? Um, and that's where I think interconnections with the environmental sector, uh, even the political sector, the business sector, what are those relationships about and how can you keep using those relationships to reconfigure the way you can continue to do things? You don't need a pandemic to think about reconfiguring. Where is the safe space for you to keep experimenting and keep thinking of different ways of doing your work. Um, and, and I would say the third way of looking at this, um, the business plan and the business modeling um, is, is going to be, how do you encourage innovation within the team uh, of what you're doing while still, uh, you know, on the one hand, it being a safe space and on the other hand, constantly thinking of the other. In this case, the other could be a sponsor, it could be your audience 
or it could be uh, uh, you know any other stakeholder what is the value that we are giving to them and the space for innovation within that uh, that to me is usually the best way to think about business models because it, it sort of every time we we worked with that we've seen older business models fail crumble and fall because you're you're always a step ahead of uh, what has the potential to fail um and 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 that space for innovation also encourages people to walk out of the box and think of new ways of surviving and recreating so these are the three ways that i would look at uh, thinking about business models mike should i come in yes please do so as 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 some of you know who 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 know me from other ateliers before i speak of business models i like to also talk about pluralizing the models we have for conceiving festivals themselves because i think we have so many more opportunities than for example importing a model from edinburgh i love the edinburgh festival but our national arts festival in south africa has a main and a fringe and i ask myself what other african and indigenous models of people gathering for cultural expression exist because there's often a resourcing aspect to that we could find economic cues that don't come from a neoliberal global space and be imported from outside and i think that's exciting so i'm working at the moment with a community of practice that gathers to listen to jazz these are mutual aid societies that double as burial societies there's a different microeconomics working it's a redistributed kind of uh, financial ecology and we're working together to see if we can find ways of of making festivals that are fed by that model so 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 to begin with um i think it's a really rich question to ask wherever we are what are the words and the concepts for festival that exist locally and i so value what carmen was saying about the the value of prioritizing the hyper local at this time of covid we've been forced not to uh, look over the heads of our adjacent communities to bring high end artists from outside and bring audiences from outside even though when that can happen special things can happen if we have a strong social foundation with our host communities but we we've had to prioritize the host communities and i think that's a huge investment in long term sustainability in terms of the models of the future mike you know um coming at the end of a very long haul flight johannesburg is 12 to 14 hour flight from europe um 31 hours normally if i'm traveling to the west coast of the us um um so so there've been opportunities and gifts indeed about the fact that our festivals who've had uh, online dimensions under covid have attracted international audiences uh, who don't have to make those trips um i think that's ecologically responsible and i hope that we can continue to hold those audiences and those engagements as we prioritize the local where we are the key curatorial challenge i think is how do we then manage the 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 inequalities and the gaps between a globally mobile clientele's understanding of what culture is about and what festival programs should offer and how what local communities need and have to express so we become bridge builders as festival makers and if the financial model can be part of that bridge so that it can maybe be free or tiered in terms of the business model structure if we have to monetize what we do and there are in south africa middle class people who can afford to buy tickets for shows and they're buying drinks at the bar so why they shouldn't be supporting artists is part of our advocacy but at the same time we have to have aspects that are that are free and aspects that can be cross subsidized and again this idea of funding ourselves because we are the closest to the vision um and i think that there's something important in that although i agree with rashmi that it it kind of can slide into the discourse of neoliberalism um but on the other hand um often we don't have other funders who fund exactly that that we know we have to do right now if we can't make a plan ourselves thanks very interesting thank you thank you very much for that and it kind of just reminded me a little bit and 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 forgive the kind of self referential plug but in a way it was what led some of us to start the sustaining theater and dance foundation last year in the midst of the covid pandemic and with its decimation of the arts sector generally but dance and theater in particular 
that are so dependent upon audiences, which are considered to be gatherings and the primary vector of the virus. You know, dance and theater makers simply had no income. Theaters were shut down, festivals were canceled and the like. So um, impossible for people to make any kind of living. And so some of us in the dance and theater sector said, let's start a foundation that looks to how we as a sector can look after ourselves as opposed to bemoaning our fate or to being dependent upon government that simply is not coming to the party. And so we began by going along to people within the sector like yourself, Brett, and said, you know, can you make a donation to an, an initial amount of capital that we then use to leverage other funding and so on, and, and then being able to not simply act in a relief kind of way, but to have projects that creators could practice their creativity and earn an income in the process as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's a model that can be used beyond COVID as well, because dance and theater are always going to be dependent on some kind of support because they're not always going to be sustainable within the marketplace as it were. But we've come to the end of our, of our panel discussion. It's, it's 1.30, but I did want to maybe just end with this because I think that Rashmi raised very important points, um, which, resonate with some of the points that were raised yesterday as well and that is for the for the arts sector and the festival making sector not to see ourselves as a silo as something separate to what is happening in the rest of society but which is kind of our traditional approach isn't it we see ourselves as being special to some extent we see ourselves as being different and we need to increasingly see ourselves as being connected to other parts of our society if COVID has done anything it's kind of made that apparent and again, just two examples from within the South African context and South African arts context in particular. So with people not being able to earn income, I think artists have begun to see the relevance of the broader campaign for a universal basic income grant that is being driven by other sectors in the context of inequality in our country. There's so many people don't have any kind of income. And suddenly artists are beginning to see, you know what, it's in our interest to be aligned with other sectors of society, because if we had a basic income grant, we wouldn't be in the desperate situation that we are. And I think similarly, people are beginning to see that um, you know, they need to be integrated into the climate justice charter campaign that is happening in South Africa as well, that you know, the interests as festival makers, as, as arts practitioners um, are kind of relevant to climate change as well, because as, the proponents of climate justice in our country have said the climate justice issues are not just about climate they're actually about social justice because so much that of the impact of climate change has to do with um who bears the brunt of it who carries the can it's not people who have necessarily contributed to climate change who are the primary sufferers of climate change and therefore the notion of climate justice being a social justice issue is a, is a very is a very important one and that's where artists need to be engaged as well so having preached a little bit at the end thank you for allowing me that um i just like to end up by saying a huge thanks to carmen to stefan and his interlocutor tara to rashmi and to brett for stepping in at the last minute like that and for being such an excellent participant as well thank, thank you to you all of you. of you and it's been great thank you inga Thank you very much, Mike, also for facilitation and also Vigdis for helping on that. Uh, thank you to the speakers. And I think the, the idea that we launched yesterday of International Festivals Declare Emergency, this initiative that is now growing out of this alumni community, is exactly a way of tackling, and maybe the title is too heavy and it has to be about offering perspectives instead of declaring emergency, but it is really a way of having uh, festivals collectively and globally uh, declare to take climate and social justice action. And I think one of the things that we could start with is tackling maybe all these questions from 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 uh, Tara or yes uh, as a starting point of this international festivals declare emergency so that would be fantastic so thank you very much everybody thank you for those people who followed on the live stream uh, see you again tomorrow for our final panel live streamed panel um, on social impact and new ways of measuring social impact